بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاۃ والسلام علی رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم ویلکم آڈینس ٹو دا ٹوکنگ دین پوڈ کاسٹ آئی ایم یور ہوس ماجد اینڈ ٹو ڈے آئی ہیو دا ریٹرن آف دا راش راد دین دا ریٹرن آف دا میک بر دا راش از بین از 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 بین آف دا ریڈ آف فار اوائل جسٹ اے فیو ویکس الحمد للہ اوکے اینڈ وی ڈو ہیو اے نو دا گیسٹ اے اسپیشل گیسٹ اے برادر فرام ایران دس برادر از این ایرانین اکیڈمک and an activist who has in-depth knowledge of the Iranian history uh, ranging from the time of the Safavid Empire, the 1979 Islamic Revolution up to modern times and uh, the brother's name is uh, Ali Raza. Uh, Assalamu alaikum brother Ali Raza, welcome to the show. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you for your invitation brother Maj. No problem, yes. no problem. Inshallah. Okay, so inshallah, let, I think we should get really into this one because I'm, I've been looking forward to this episode uh, because there's so much to speak about. And um, I did want to ask how Russia's holiday was, but we'll uh, leave that for another time. Uh, so yeah, inshallah, the, as you know, this topic is about the latest issue uh, concerning the conflict between America and Iran. So what we've seen in the last couple of weeks is there was an incident on the 29th of December where the uh, uh, Americans, they killed quite a few Iranian-backed militiamen in Iraq and in Syria. And as, as a response, uh, an Iranian-backed militia called the Qatayb Hezbollah, they attacked uh, the US embassy in Baghdad. Um, and what we see after that was on the 3rd of January, America assassinated General Qasim Soleimani, Um, on the orders of President Trump. And Qasem Soleimani, uh, we'll speak a little, bo- a little bit more about him later, but he was, as they say, uh, probably the second most powerful man in Iran. Uh, then we saw Iran threaten America with severe revenge. And we even saw Iraqi lawmakers um, pass a non-binding resolution calling on the government to end foreign troop presence in Iraq. Um, and subhanAllah, on the, uh, on the 8th of January, in a military operation codenamed Operation Mata Soleimani, the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps, they launched numerous ballistic missile attacks at the Ain al-Assad airbase air in Alamba uh, government in Iraq, and also another airbase in Erbil. Um, and also around the same time, actually on the same, on the mm. same night, we see that uh, a passenger uh, airline for the uh, Ukrainian passenger airline was shot down, killing uh, 176 people on board. Now, at that time, uh, nobody knew they were shot down other than the people who shot them down. But um, now, today, the uh, Iranians have actually uh, accepted that this was a human mistake. But we'll speak a little bit more about that. So, before getting into the, the sort of meat of the, the discussion... Um, what I would say is that the whole issue that's escalated is because of the person that was assassinated and that was Qasim Soleimani. So, you know, uh, it may be a good place to start, Rash, if we can maybe speak a little bit about uh, Qasim Soleimani to uh, update you know, anyone who doesn't know who he was. Yeah, so that's quite an interesting question to start off with, really, because I think the reason why a lot of people didn't know about him is he's not, your, he's not like a politician. You know, a lot, of, a lot of the conflicts that have been going on, a lot of the times when you hear things in international media, it tends to be like political figures. It tends to be political figures. So with the, with the case of Qasim Soleimani, because he was more of a, he was a major general and he was part of the Islamic Revolutionary um, Guard Corps, he was actually part of the Quds Force. Mm. And that Quds Force was, if you want to explain it, it's almost like the equivalent of the CIA for America. It's like a, a force that is involved in kind of projects and activity, which is more aligned to kind of not outright military action that is just done, you know, on the forefront. It sometimes is kind of undercover, that kind of activity as uh, well covert covert, covert is the right word to use yeah so the thing is the reason why this is so significant is at the end of the day he, he had he had built quite a very popular support within iran 
to the extent that many people saw him as someone who like represented the revolution represented the the ideals of muslims that are that were living in iran and to the extent that he'd he'd built up to this position because of lots of past history within the within the military that supported the the general masses ideals and in fact some people were even saying that you mentioned that the second most powerful person in iran some people even say that arguably he was the most powerful or the most supported person in iran Okay. okay especially i think more recently because there is a bit more of an uprising against the the current status quo and against the the ayatollah and against the current regime so he did have that level of support um and maybe the reason we didn't hear his name as much before is like i said is because he was more of a military figure than a political figure okay so um, so brother ali raza uh, what's the uh, the view of uh, qasim sulaimani from within Iran? There are quite few different views actually about Qasem Soleimani in Iran. <clears throat> the religious people, they see him like the mainly as a, like the commander of like the Islam or soldier of Islam, rather, you know, like the, as he said himself, basically. The nationalism people see him as a, like the national hero, like the who defending like the you know Iranian like the Iran's border you know like the outside Iran basically and the ordinary people in Iran who doesn't even you know like the involved in politics and so ever they've seen him in few incidents like the you know like the which happened like the in last few years like the earthquake and this sort of things you know he was within people supporting people helping out people over there you know so by doing all of this he kind of gained like the good support actually mm. uh, you know within like the uh, uh, young generation and also within the politicians as well because he never t- uh, took a part actually like the you know in politics especially within iran actually outside iran probably most people think actually which is you know uh, maybe uh, which is the fact actually he's been you know like the uh, the main, uh, you know, uh, what you call the main person to design, you know, the uh, mm, politics actually outside Iran, especially in basically Middle East, like the than, like the Europe or you know, like in Syria, Syria, in yeah. Iraq, in Yemen and uh, Afghanistan, you know, like the Lebanon, you know, these countries. The foreign policy of Iran in these countries was probably in control of Qasem Soleimani. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm not talking about like the Europe or, you know, like the, the nuclear deal, you know, which Iran did with the, uh, what you call like the European countries and US. He was not involved, you know, in those things, you know, much, but he was heavily involved actually in foreign policy of I- Iran in these uh, probably five, six countries, especially the countries who has got big uh, Shia populations, basically. Okay. So he gained uh, really like the good support basically in Iran and we shouldn't forget the media in Iran had big impact on you know this popularity as well they kind of picked him up you know like this since uh, Iran uh, since era of US war basically until that time even he was head of basically the uh, al uh, uh, uh basically uh, group you know like the outside Iran but uh, he was not known, you know, uh, he was not very famous, rather, you know, like the, by those times. So he became more popular since like the probably 2007 or 8. Okay, okay. That's kind of what we're get hearing more here is that since his since his assassination a lot of the media has been kind of highlighting more how he was involved in a lot of the activity like the foreign activity that the Iranian military were carrying out whereas like you just said before that many of us had never even heard of his name okay exactly yeah that's uh, that's the point which I was going to make yeah so what we uh, so I mean uh, that's Subhanallah uh, a really good uh, introduction, but uh, the because the podcast is not about 
Qasim Soleimani as such, and actually not even really about his assassination. This podcast is looks at a deeper issue, because what we've seen in the last few days, certainly since the assassination, we've seen people talking <clears throat> about the next World War Three. We've seen people talking about like you know. Uh, the Day of Judgment is coming close now because of this conflict between the Americans and the Iranians, right? But what we want to discuss today in this podcast is the fact that what is the real relationship between America and Iran? Because there are those who claim that the true nature of uh, the relationship between Iran and America is not what is shown in the media, is not in the Death to America chants. It's not in the rhetoric. In fact, uh, there are signs that show that there is you know, collaboration uh, between the two sides at a very high level. Uh, but, however, one could argue that looking at the recent events, you know, with the, with the, with the stuff that's, that was cracking off, that actually this shows that there is actually a real uh, conflict between Iran and America. So let's inshallah look at the question about what is the real relationship and is the, the issue, the animosity between America and Iran, is this genuine? To answer your question, brother Maj, I think we should go back to uh, the time of Iranian revolution, 1979, or even a couple of few years before that, basically. What's happened? Why uh, basically this... Uh, Ayatollah, so you know, like the so-called religious party in Iran, took the power. Okay, so let's look at to the history a bit. Uh, before revolution, about uh, ten years before revolution, there were some raids up against the uh, setup in Iran, the kings of uh, the king of Iran, uh, the Shah of Iran, and so on. But we shouldn't forget, so probably nowadays most of the people, they think the only party that existed and they were fighting or uh, protesting against, you know, the system by that time, it was a religious party. But no, the answer is like, if you uh, read the history, there were several groups involved. One of the biggest group which was involved actually in this uh, uh, protests and, you know, revolution, it was a group called like the in Persian or Farsi, it was like the two days, which is, you know, uh, the group, uh, the communist group, basically, right? Which was heavily supported by uh, Russia, okay, uh, by that time. So another group was Fadayan uh, Islam, another group was called Mujahideen Khalq, which was, however, that Mujahideen Khalq was such a, a bit like the kind of like Islamic, but mixed up like the Islamic and communist group, basically. Okay? And uh, uh, which uh, they always rejected like the, the concept of the Vilayat Fagit, but however, you know, they were like a kind of secular Muslim communist, basically, I would say. Okay? And another group, uh, such a, uh, it was such a small group, uh, was the Hezbe, like the Jumhuri Islamid. Uh, uh, Islamic, uh, basically, now, you know, uh, which they've got the power, you know, Islamic Republic or uh, whatever they call. So, Reza, so, are you saying that these were the kind of the factions on the ground, what, 10 years before the revolution? Exactly, 10 years before the revolution. These were the groups, you know, like the, they were against the king by that time. And, you know, uh, uh, so what's happened here is if... Again, we go back to the history, to the neighboring countries. By, by that time, the Communist Party was, were taking over, like, Afghanistan. Mm. And the USA and West, you know, they, had, they were really worried about, you know, the Communist Party is going to take over Iran as well, which was, like, the good way toward, like, the Arab and so on and on. Very strategic so, point in the Middle East. Exactly. In the meantime... What's happened, the king of Iran, the Shah of Iran by that time, uh, he kind of thought like that he's got good enough power to become kind of like an independent secular state rather than just, you know, like the uh, following basically like the USA or Western basically commands. Okay, so he kind of wanted to become a bit more independent and the uh, price of oil and these things, you know, like the 
before revolution, it clearly shows actually what he was doing. He was such a uh, basically nationalism person. Uh, as soon as he got, you know, a bit more power, he started to, you know, uh, on some extent, you know, similarly probably to Erdogan. Sometimes he's following the U.S. orders. Sometimes, you know, we see like he's kind of, you know, uh, more uh, nationalism rather than religious and so on. So there were uh, two options by that time for America, for USA, either to support communist or Islamic party. So the Islamic party, it was kind of like the Shia party rather than Islamic party, you know, uh, in Iran. So, the, so the, this this party the, this party is the party of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. Exactly, party of the Ayatollah but, Khomeini. But this is a small, small. Exactly, it used to be a very small party. Okay, and then what's happened? They started even you know the evidence shows the communication you know the letters been sent by Ayatollah Khomeini to the president of uh, time of USA basically you know like the. Uh, everything, you know, for USA in Iran will be normal as before, so you shouldn't be worried about that and so on and on. So Ayatollah Khomeini, you know, kind of, you know, like the, uh, made the uh, US set up by that time to trust him actually. Was this before he was um, expelled from the country? Exactly, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, before even he was expelled mm-hmm. from the uh, country and later, you know, like the We've got even more evidence later when Ayatollah Khomeini was in Paris, basically, in uh, France. Uh, so they had, like, the, you know, uh, uh, quite few, like, the uh, letters, like, there were quite few letters between, like, the Ayatollah Khomeini and the uh, U.S., uh, basically, uh, what you call, like, the president uh, by that time, that's, you know, what will happen for America and so on and then after the Iranian revolution. So, Iran, the, the Ayatollah Khomeini came to Iran from France, basically, with by full support of USA, mm-hmm. okay? And the Shah of Iran, been removed from Iran, he left Iran uh, by order of, like the order from basically uh, what you call USA, yeah. right? So, so this was when so I clear. think... Now even the CIA uh, released actually all these documents. So... Yeah, I mean... Were, yeah. I mean, you, from, from these documents you're on about, the declassified CIA documents, uh, it shows that there was a contact between Khomeini and the Americans in 1963 when basically uh, Khomeini uh, he sent a message to the Kennedy administration uh, advising, them, advising them that he was not opposed to American interest in Iran. And also what he said was that the American presence was necessary as a counterbalance to Soviet and possibly British influence. And later we see that uh, Khomeini sent a message from Paris uh, in January 1979. And as we know, 1979 is the year when, as you said, he was allowed back into Iran uh, with the full permission of America. And um, basically what the message said was that the oil, the oil flow will continue after the establishment of the Islamic Republic. We will not act as an exporter of revolution. And you can tell the American Jews not to worry about the Jewish future in Iran. So, uh, you know, as, as you're saying there, you can see clearly that uh, there was a collusion at the highest level. Exactly, that's the point. Yeah, they were like a good communication within them and, you know, all these things. However, after revolution, what's happened? Again, you know, people would start to think probably what was the reason why Iranian government by that time took the... Uh, what you call like the, uh, the USA, like the uh, what you call like the people who were working in US embassy as a hostage, basically. Mm. So again, another point here could be by that time the communists completely club basically in uh, what you call like the Russia. So the Iranian government was based on basically uh, Iranian revolution was kind of based up, you know, like the it wasn't the the uh, famous saying was no west no east just you know islamic republic so the 
East one was gone basically. So they were always looking for kind of like the uh, enemy, outsider enemy to unite people actually, you know, like the, uh, from their point of view, like the Islamic League, right? So it was the time actually, and it kind of, again, you know, if we look at to the evidence or the hostages, right, from the president of time of Iran, uh, has, uh, Bani Sadr, right? Who is in France at the moment? Who escaped from Iran in like the Iraq Iran war? Okay, he clearly says the hostage, you know, like the what you call like taking those people as a hostage. It was need of USA and bo both USA and Iran by that time. Subhanallah. Right, it kind of benefited both. Mm. Right, for America, right. From one point of view, yes, it's benefited Iranian government because there were too many external internal issues actually in Iran. So Iranian are the reality. There are many nationalism actually in Iran. So the government, the system by that time, they united actually both Islamic parties and nationalism actually like against another external enemy and. It was good excuse for America to have like the bases actually in the country, uh, uh, like the like the countries which are surrounding Iran, such as like the Afghanistan, Turkey, and by that time, so uh, they didn't have many bases in Iraq because Saddam was uh, already like the present there. So yeah, you know, it gave the uh, it gave opportunity to uh, U.S. aides basically to uh, have like the, some uh, bases actually over there. Okay, so it was again, you know, like the, uh, this hostage, uh, hostage things, you know, was both in, uh, in benefit of uh, the system in Iran and uh, USA. Okay, so everything, you know, yes, that's right. It's not like the probably people will start to think, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying this clearly. It is something written that the USA ordered the Iranian government to take those people as a hostage. Okay, but it was something you know which was fulfilling the objective of both sides basically. Okay, it was something like an unwritten agreement between actually these two systems. Okay, you, I mean to be honest with you, uh, as you've mentioned there, and and, and uh, just to just to sort of like highlight the importance of what you're saying here because you know here we're not just saying that the person Ayatollah Khomeini who uh, used to chant death to America it, we're not just saying the fact that uh, he was in contact with the Americans actually what we're saying is that he the, for his return to uh, Iran was actually orchestrated because even the military, the, the military elite within Iran, i.e. the Shah's military, i.e. the military that was a, basically an American military, the fact that the Americans sent representatives there to tell them not to uh, perform a coup on the Prime Minister, but also to allow Khomeini to enter Iran. So I think for our audience, I think that's one key point, what we're, what we're saying here, is the I mean, there's many quotes, but you know, I'm not going to go through, not go through them because you can actually check all this up because a lot of this is you'll find on declassified uh, information. But mm. just a point I want to highlight, Russia, because it's a massive point: the fact that the Americans, from the very beginning, in a way, you'd say, orchestrated the birth of the Islamic Revolution Republic in Iran. Exactly. And the, the way to look at it as well, there was a lot of uproar when some of these cables that were released by the BBC um, came out. The Iranian public were, you know, a lot of them kind of came out to say, you know, they were. this was shocking revelation really because the whole birth of that Islamic Republic was very much around the idea that we don't want um, America to have any influence over us anymore because of the previous administration, and previous regime. Um, on top of that, there's three aspects you can look at. You know, just kind of highlighting what you've been saying is the, to facilitate Khomeini, the three sides to look at is first of all, like Brother Reza has mentioned, that when he was in Paris or when he was in France, there was communication, yeah. as mentioned. Secondly, the fact that um, the Shah actually left Iran, or he actually went on a vacation. 
And even that was facilitated by the US because they said, look, there's, there's issues on the ground here to just settle things down a little bit. It's convenient if you go away for a little while. And then the third aspect is that the, the military itself allowed Khomeini to come back and establish that position in a time when he had support, yet the the pre you know the shah would not have allowed what happened afterwards if he was there possibly but so if you see that those three elements already highlight what strong uh, control the us already had on the birth of this republic so that is just one aspect i think we'll speak about a few other but that just highlights one aspect of is there really this conflict between us and iran if the very birth of that was aided and abetted by the the US administration even there was a a, a secret document that was released after 35 years mm. where it was made clear to Khomeini by the Americans that they were flexible about the Iranian political system mm. so so the Wilayat al faqi system basically they were flexible on that okay so let's move on a little i think you guys have really given some some uh, beautiful examples and, and this is something which is not opinion based. These are some things which are in the open now. So we see that from the very first, from the onset that America was involved with the uh, uh, with the uh, Iranians, right? Um, so would we say that could somebody argue that Ayatollah Khomeini used them to get into power, but then soon as he was in power, then from then till now they've been enemies. So I would ask a question, maybe Reza can help us with this one, is that some people did argue that when Khomeini came in, or not just argue, obviously he dealt with some of the military to make sure he like purged some of the military to make sure that there wasn't as much influence. If there was any factions in the military that were still supportive of the Shah, then that to get rid of them. So people might argue that the Khomeini used America in order to get that position of um, influence and you know become in charge of of iran at the time exactly and and then subsequently carried out whatever his will was yeah. but then i think and you can give us some detail on this i think subsequently and history testifies to this that all of the expeditions that america have been carrying out in the region like in the likes of afghanistan and iraq these have been aided by iraq i'm sorry by iran and by their military. So can anybody really conclude that, you know, they're not carrying out activity that is in both of their interests, both US and Iran? It was actually a really good question from Brother Rush. So uh, are they really Iran and America? Are they really enemy? Or So uh, if we look at from aspect of, right, they in last at least you know like the 20 years so clearly they worked toward actually the same objective whether iranian like the uh, leader or uh, the supreme leader Khomeini and the revolutionary guard they saying you know death to america or not you know whether they saying or not they worked actually toward the same objective so we shouldn't look at from the aspect of you know like the, what they saying actually we should look at to what they're doing. What they're doing, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Actions, reality, what actions they're doing, speak louder than words, yeah? Exactly. It tells us everything, actually. You know, the way they work, actually. But, and another thing, if they were real enemy, okay, if America was like the, you know, uh, what you call enemy for Iran, why Iran kind of invited with again her action, okay? Not by saying, okay? In saying it was against, actually, even it's, against right now you know like the americans like the troops and military bases actually in like the country surrounded uh, like the which surrounded iran but in action no iran invited the iranian government when we're talking about iran it's the iranian system government rather than evil right the iranian system or government and mainly the supreme leader and the revolutionary guard they invited actually america to afghanistan Right. So because they thought Taliban is big threat for Iranian like the government, okay, for the Shia system, for the Layat Fadi system, right? So America was less risky for Iranian government than Taliban. That is by uh, uh, Iranian government, in fact, invited uh, America to uh, Afghanistan. And 
what I mean by inviting, so they gave all the information actually about the, um, you know, Taliban's and, you know, how they should attack the Taliban's and so on and on, uh, which been admitted again by president of time of Iran, Hatami. Right, he was one uh, the reformer. Even ju- ju- just to stop, stop you there for a second, uh, uh, yeah. Brother Ali Raza, um, just to add to what you're saying, is yes. there's uh, there's even um, uh, an interview by a senior State Department official, American, uh, called Ryan Crocker, mm-hmm. and basically what he was saying is that uh, the uh, the Iranians actually gave a, a map and actually gave a strategy, and they shared the information. Of the locations of the Taliban and also um, the strategy on which areas to hit first and how to take over, this was all given by the Iranians to the Americans. And who was this given by? This was given by no other than Qasim Soleimani through him himself. I was going to yeah come to that point as well. Qasim Soleimani. Yeah, it was all given by Qasem Soleimani. Okay, let's again go back to, you know, uh, who was Qasem Soleimani? He was born in a city called Kerman, which is near to Baluchistan, right? Now it should make more sense. He was like the one of the higher, like the, not the highest commander by that time, one of the higher commanders, you know, of Revolutionary Guard, who was actually involved heavily in like the, Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan border by that time, before Iran, Iraq war. Okay, that makes sense. Right? So, uh, he gave actually, exactly, he gave all this information to USA by that time. So, after the USA got rid of, kind of like they got rid of Taliban, what happened? They attacked uh, to, you know, uh, they invaded uh, Iraq, basically, in time of the uh, George Bush, right? So, in the meantime, Qasem Soleimani became the head of the Al Quds mm. Party in Iran. So, what was the responsibility responsibility of Al Quds Party now to move from east of Iran to west of Iran, or southwest rather, mm. which was Iraq and you know like the Kurdistan and so on and on. Okay, now. What's happened because of the eight years with war between Iran and Iraq, right? The Iranian, especially Revolutionary Guard, they had all the information about the, what you call like the places, like the, you know, the, uh, what you call like the army bases, like the, in Iraq and so on and on. They so, have many so, so are you, are, and, are, you talk, yes. are you talking about Iraq now or are you talking about Afghanistan? Yeah. I, I moved from basically Afghanistan to Iraq. Now. So, Abbas so, and Soleimani been moved from like the east of Iran and took over the, you know, uh, what you call like they've been uh, replaced by another like the commander, like the revolution uh, commander who was the head of the revol- uh, Al Quds basically, Hezb, okay. Uh, uh, is, this because, is this because that Quds force was being utilized in kind of all of those strategic projects in those neighboring countries? Exactly. They knew, they had all the informations basically about like the all like the army bases in Afghanistan first and then in Iraq as well because of the eight years war between Iraq and Iran. Right. Mm-hmm. So now it was the time. OK. They gave all the information basically to uh, USA, you know, like in Iraq. And that is why even if you think about that, you know, like the, the USA, invaded Iraq in how many days? Probably between 20 to 30 days, right? Yeah. They knew exactly where it were, okay? And they took over the country in basically uh, what you call like the, uh, within a month. But the so, most important point here, if we move on from like the, what you call the role of Ghassan Soleimani, okay? Let's move to Iraq after war, basically. America, gave the ruling system of like the Iraq directly to Iranian government, mm. right? By bringing the uh, Hezb, called Hezbollah Dava basically to the power. If we again read the history, most of the members of Hezbollah Dava, they've been trained in Iraq. Mm. And the head of them was the president basically, or prime minister by that time, 
Malik Nuriel Malik. Nuriel Malik, sorry. Yeah, Nuriel Malik. So he was actually, you know, like he studied in Qom, he lived in Qom. He was more Iranian rather than Iraqi, actually. And we saw that, you know, like straight after he came to, basically, he took the power, right? So if Iran and America was enemy, okay, we should ask this question from ourselves. Why hmm. the American gave the ruling system even in Iraq to the Iran. party which was clearly hmm. supported by Iranian, not only Iranian government, by Iranian system, Velayat Fagi. Yeah. I, I, right? And I think, Reza, this is the, the most important, well, one of the most important things that our audience should take away because a lot of the time, especially the assassination of Soleimani now, what we see most of all is, you know, the mainstream media is very much trying to promote this, you know, war between the two, the two countries. Mm. You know, the mainstream media's objective in this whole episode, and not when I say mainstream media, nowadays that doesn't mean just the different TV stations and the news stations. I also mean social media. I also mean like Twitter campaigns and hashtags that are started. So everything we saw when this, you know, the Soleimani assassination happened was all of this plethora of different campaigns that kicked off about Iran versus US, World War Three hashtags mm. and all of these things. Some of them may have been started by people and some news, but we also know some of them are, are often, some of these hashtags are actually started by bots, by campaigns, by people with an agenda. Yeah, hold So yeah. I think what Reza's point people need to take away is don't always look at the rhetoric. Don't always look at the mainstream media. Look at the actions. And what he's saying is if the US actions were to give... Iran the control or the kind of key powers in Iran the control of Iraq how is it that there is a conflict between Iran and US when they are willing to do something like that amongst other things so I think that's a really key point exactly yeah the probably one point which supports your argument is maybe most of the people you know they might start to think yeah if it's the case why the U.S., you know, like the American has got problem with Iranian, like the, with nuclear power, basically. Mm. That's another point, you know, like the most of the Muslims actually thinking in this day and age, right? Yes, America wants powerful Iranian army and government actually in the region, but not the one with the nuclear power. Mm. Because don't forget this nuclear power or whatever, any weapon, it belongs to Muslims at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Right, Iran is another Muslim land, and it becomes uh, it, it basically uh, what you call like it belong to Muslims, and they don't want actually this. But okay, let's go back from here to basically Iraq issue again. So after they handed over Iraq to Iran, what happened? Few years later, we can see existence of uh, uh, Daesh, ISIS. Right. But even before that, ju just just one thing I wanted to add was yes. just so that people don't think that uh, this is opinion based or we're making things up. But actually, there were diplomatic cables that were leaked by WikiLeaks showed that showed that uh, you know the uh, the commander Petri uh, Petrius is it Petrius Petraeus Petraeus yeah the main guy in uh, American guy in Iraq where basically you know he himself was uh, communicating to Qasem Soleimani through the Iraqi leaders. And at one point, uh, you may recall when uh, Muqtada al-Sadr and the Badr Brigade, I'm sure the Badr Brigade is his group as a Badr Brigade. Anyway, the, sorry, um, the, the Mahdi Army. Mahdi. The, yeah, Jish the Mahdi Army, Mahdi, yeah. yeah. When they were fighting the Americans, actually, it was Qasim Soleimani, i.e. the Iranians, that um, aided and secured a ceasefire between Muqtada, Muqtada al-Sadr's militia, the Mahdi Army, and the US-backed Iraqi government. So what you can see clearly, and I just want to make this clear to our audience out there, is the fact that what we can see is that if Iran really wanted to uh, uh, remove America from the region, if it really wanted to give a killer blow to its number one enemy, the great Satan, okay, it could have done that in Afghanistan and Iraq, especially with the majority of the uh, American military in those areas. What do we see? We see that when the, Amer when the Americans came in Iraq, 
the message that came from Iran, i.e. from a, a, a religious Shia point of view, was that there is no jihad against the uh, Americans as long as they don't go to our red, the red lines, i.e. as long as they don't go to our uh, like shrines and our you know uh, uh, religious places. Basically, we don't have a problem with them if they, if, as long as they don't go that far. So what we can clearly see is that if they wanted to give America a nosebleed and make this a Vietnam for America, they could have easily done that. But what did they do? They neutralized the uh, Shia uh, factions of Iraq to accept America. And then, like you said, and it's a fantastic point you made, Brother Ali Raza, is that the government that came in place, the Nuri Malki government, this was one which was uh, commanded from Iran, from Tehran. And to think that the Americans would have gone to such a big uh, expense to remove Saddam Hussein and all this, to and to give it to on a plate to their biggest enemy, Iran, in the region, that's obviously not going to happen. The Americans are not this stupid. Yeah, and you know, exactly, and even the even after that, the existence of like the uh, Daesh, like the, in Iraq, and then Syria, right, and then it kind of was extending toward like the Lebanon as well. It gives us quite clear view toward like the the Shia crescent, basically, right. So, and it is exactly in middle of the basically all like the Muslim lands, right. So. The Shia prison is surrounded by, like the basically, uh, if we call it like the, uh, I don't want to make it more like the sectarian, but you know, it's from Fekhi point of view, like the Sunni Shia, uh, Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims, right? The Shias are exactly within, like the, you know, like the exactly in center from like the what you call east to west of Middle East, right? So yeah. Imrita clearly like the handing over basically these areas to Iran to make basically like to keep uh, mainly like the Arabs, you know, like in this fear, like the, you know what, Iran is actually always here, right? You need us to be in Middle East basically. And the Arabs, they clear, they, we can clearly see they giving their, you know, uh, what you call basis for uh, U.S. basically, what you call like the army, so on and on. And that is why we can see hundreds of like the U.S. army bases actually in uh, we- Muslim lands and especially within like the uh, Middle East. Okay, yes. but that is, a, we'll, we'll come to that point in a moment because we do need to discuss, uh, we will discuss what the purpose is of, of Iran. Why would America be supporting them? We will come to that. But you were going to mention about uh, how um, the Iranians helped the Americans against Daesh in Iraq and Syria. That's what you were going to touch upon. Maybe give us a few examples that we can move on, inshallah. Uh, sorry, can you ask your question once more, please? I... So, so basically, I was, uh, you were going to speak about the emergence of ISIS. Yes. And how Iran, in fact, facilitated also this to fight Exactly, right. So again, you know, like the, if Iran and America was like the big enemy for each other, so what's happened in like the Iraq, like the after, like the, you know, during the uh, Daesh time, uh, it was again different. So Iranian, uh, like the, especially Qasem Soleimani and al Ghuls group, they united like the, some Shia, like the groups, such as like the Zainabi Yun and Fatimi Yun, Zainabi Yun from Pakistan and Fatimi Yun from Afghanistan and some other Shia groups basically from Iran. So they were fighting on the ground and the US army was supporting them on the basically using the missiles and you know what you call like the like air, air support. Air strikes. Yeah, exactly. So what what you basically what you're basically saying there is that on the ground you had Iranian backed militia and supporting them directly militarily was Americans. Is that what you're saying there? Exactly. And we've got clear cut evidence about, you know, like the, even Qasem Soleimani met, you know, like the, one of the uh, most famous commanders, you know, I don't remember the name now, you know, like the, of US in uh, Kurdistan, Kurdistan of the basically Iraq. And basically they were organizing and, you know, sorting the things out, how they can get rid of like the uh, Daesh. 
you know, like the, by that time. So they clearly work together toward the, uh, what you call mutual, like the enemy, basically. Okay, so when they've got the same enemy, they were kind of what you call like the, they've been working clearly together. And even, you know, like the, from my point of view, it's not only my point of view, probably they are, you know, like the, many people, you know, they uh, in Iran, they see from this aspect, you know, now, you know what, Iranian regime, they didn't need Qasem Soleimani. Okay, it wasn't like the Iran and America, they are not enemy, basically. Iranian system, even Iranian government, they didn't need Qasem Soleimani anymore. That is why, you know, they gave signal to America to get rid of, basically, Qasem Soleimani, because he became really popular, you know, like the, in Iran. And he could be potential problem later. And again, you know, like the, uh, just a quick point about this, maybe, you know, like the, um, it's a bit of uh, discussion, but because of the, it is quite clear now, like the Khamenei is suffering from cancer. And he is planning for the next leader, basically, which, you know, most says, you know, like the, it's his son. Okay. And the Revolutionary Guard, especially like the Qasem Soleimani, he has got really like the power. And uh, it could be like the, uh, he could be potential problem, actually, for how many son to become like the next like the successor, basically. Yeah. And I think right? that, that's what it kind of exposes the hypocrisy also of these Western nations, you know, because I think the reason for the uproar as well, internationally as well, is the fact that when you're talking about assassinating a general, this is, a, you know, we talked about it in one of our recent podcasts. This is like state funded. This is state terrorism, really, because, you know, it's not the same as them going and killing Osama bin Laden, is it? It's This is someone who is linked to a sovereign state. Iran is a sovereign state and you're going and assassinating the major general of a sovereign state. It's not the same as just going and killing some random mm. person or a, 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 who you class as a terrorist. Mm. So what you're saying is that that was for si potentially, look, it ha we can see off the back of this, off the back of the Soleimani assassination, that nationalist like sentiment has grown in Iran now that our people are, have come together from a, a nationalistic standpoint. And exactly, that's the, that's really good point. And also, we shouldn't forget that you know, like the, there were quite few people from Obama's administration and also George Bush administration as well. You know what they said? They said we had access actually to Qasem Soleimani. We could actually, you know, like the, get rid of him, but we didn't do that. So why did? It, and now you know, like the Donald Trump, he says, you know, he killed actually many like the uh, American soldiers, mm, mm. right, they could actually get rid of him like the five years ago to avoid basically, you know, like the American soldiers to get killed by him. I think right. also, yeah, yeah I'm, uh, exactly. I mean, I think going into whether Soleimani was uh, assassinated uh, with the Ira Iranian tension, it, it does kind of make sense. But I think we should probably at this stage stick, stick to the facts, I would say. Uh, what I would say, though, is... Um, as Rash mentioned about the, the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, this wasn't uh, an ordinary guy, you know, this was basically, you know, uh, one of the top, top, top uh, members of the government. And uh, the fact that he was killed in, in such a way and the reaction by the Iranians, I think, should is, is probably our final point in a way. I mean, there's many examples, but some of the ones that you guys are given to show that even the response of the Iranians um, and the back chat, uh, 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 discussions via Switzerland, even after the attack between the Iranians and between the Americans, um, and this is sort of common knowledge now, and the fact that the Iranians actually killed more innocent people in a, airline, uh, in a passenger air aircraft than they killed Americans on that night, you know, it goes to show that the response, in my opinion, wasn't uh, the right response in the sense like, you know, to be honest with you, if they had killed Harmony, I honestly don't think the, the response would have been even even much worse, to be honest with you. But anyway, listen, because time is clicking on. Let's let's move on a bit uh, because I know obviously, you know, we've got our uh, Iran's uh, 
so a specialist here and uh, you know inshallah ta'ala could speak for Iran uh, yeah, about Iran or day just yes. one very quick point actually yes. you touched actually really good point as well you know the Iranian response you know for the revenge basically right what was that it was like they targeted the military base which was the biggest American military base I think is if I'm uh, right you know in Iraq and even one single Iraq, person, Iraq, in Iraq. In Iraq, yeah. Even one single person did not get basically killed there, right? So what it tells you, it clearly tells everyone, basically, you know what? Iran should have done some like the, something basically Iranian government because it was the requirement from the like the people on the ground, yeah. right? But what's happened here? It, it is quite clear that they already made the agreement, you know what, you guys leave the bases, right, and we're going to attack here. That's, you know... That, they, that's they, they told the, the Iraqis. Exactly. That, 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 that's quite, you know, like the clear. Even one single person in biggest, like the military base in Iraq wasn't present. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So it, it says everything, basically. Exactly, exactly. And... Uh... And I think that that's, you know, really also highlights the fact that had there been a, a real a real um, issue between these two countries, then the Americans were certainly uh, in reach. And especially with what you mentioned early on in the podcast, that the Iranians actually know everything about Iraq. They know everything about Afghanistan uh, from an intelligence point of view. So they would have known where to hit, what to hit. And the fact that, you know, nobody, not a single person even got scratched. And this was after the killing of such a high profile person really raises the questions. But okay, let, let's move on. Let's move on, inshallah ta'ala. So I think um, it would be fair to say, and certainly for those watching, or actually they're not watching because <laughs> this is just an audio podcast. But for those people listening, um, that, you know, you guys have given out, given some really clear examples of the uh, uh, collusion between Iran and America from the even before the 1979 revolution up until today. Um, so the next question really uh, leading to, you know, uh, uh, to, to looking forward now. Um, so, you know, what do you guys think are the plans for uh, America's plans, shall I say, for the region? And how does Iran play a part in this going forward because surely it does i mean the fact that soon after the attack trump said i've told the un that i want to sit down i want to speak to the iranians you know he even praised the iranian people and even he praised the iranian government okay so uh, what we can see is certainly america has uh, plans for the region and iran plays a, a role in this as it has already done for the last few decades what are these plans going forward oh okay yeah, so if I just, if I, if you don't mind, if I just yeah, kind yeah, of dive yeah. in that quickly for that one, because, you know, it's not a case of saying, you know, some people might say is, you know, is the conclusion that Iran are like puppets of America. I think it's not a case of just saying that whatever, whenever, whatever America says, Iran does. I think it's a case of, more a case of Iran are trying to execute certain kind of strategies of their own in the region. But then when it goes out of line... US with their influence is able to almost like in a way clip its wings it's able to say you know we want you to now now that you've carried out some of our helped us carry out some of our strategic objectives which aid you as well within the likes of Syria within Afghanistan within Iraq we now want you to kind of be, be go back to the more isolist kind isolationist kind of approach whereby we don't want you to venture out and influence those nations anymore Rather, you know, this is again where, you know, because there's, as I think Reza, when you were telling me previously as well, that some of the sentiment on the ground in Iran is against the Ayatollah, against the current regime. There is a lot of uprisings. And you mentioned that, I think when we were talking before the podcast, that there are a lot of anti-government um, marches and protests going on, a lot of which that you would have thought if the US was sincere in any way, that they would be promoting, the media would be showing this as well. Instead, all of that is being hidden. So I think it's important for us to see that you, the Iran plays a role, 
but the yeah. US is kind of stopping it from venturing beyond what the US has kind of designed for it in the region and that's why i think going forward some of the things we probably need to discuss towards the kind of coming to the end of the podcast is you know iran is kind of like a scarecrow in the region still as kind of from the shia side whilst the support they give more directly to the saudis is like the other side to keep that conflict going and keep that fire burning Uh, yes, it's a really good point you mentioned, brother, because uh, even, you know, now uh, we uh, sitting and talking, discussing here, there is a protest in Iran. Who knows, actually, that? No one knows. Why the media, you know, like the, not, like the, the Western media, they are not promoting that, right? And it is pure, like the secular people are protesting, basically, mm. against the system in Iran. And it was about a month ago. 1,500 people, you know, most say it's like some, it is certain that 300 people, it's been uh, basically proved by like the, what you call like the UN, I think, you know, like the 300 people, right, got killed about a month ago, right? And some says it is over 1,500 people. So imagine this was happening in one of the Arab countries, which is most of them are Sunni, right? The U.S. government would directly support them, right, to overtake the basically like the system to completely secularize the you know the uh, you know setup over there, right? But even there are many, unfortunately, which is unfortunate. After during the Iranian Revolution was kind of like the Islamic Revolution, even if they weren't like if some people they were like the seculars or whatever. They still had a strong belief actually for this. Stuff. That's the reality. Okay. And uh, but at the moment, unfortunately, because of this system, what they've done in the last 40 years, like the hypocrisy, and you know, they use the Islam basically to rule over or whatever, right? Corruption as so well. Most of the exactly most of the people, uh, I mean, like the big population, they became really secular, mm-hmm. right? So. It was the if Iran was this system was enemy of like the America, right? What they would do? They would definitely support actually these people, right? To overtake the country, and they would have like a pure like a secular system in Iran, right? And they even thinking like the, you know, imagine this basically the the U.S. is still you know like the, they know. This system is more beneficial for them in long term than the secular, right? Iranian, the secular Iranian uh, government. So, because if the uh, what you call like the, the system in Iran is secular, what would happen? You know, like the the seculars are more like the nationalistic people, basically. They would. Uh, what you call focus more on their economy, they would more focus on their own country and so on and on. They wouldn't be bothered about what's going on in other Muslim countries and uh, they wouldn't be really bothered about you know what system uh, is going to rule over in other countries. But this system in Iran, the system of Velayat Fagi, we know clearly they are basically completely against the unity of like the Muslims. Right. Yeah, yeah. They, when they talking about Muslims, they considering. I'm not saying they are not saying like they, you know, Sunnis are not Muslim or they are not saying this. That's something completely. But their main focus is Shias and they, the Shia areas, and they wouldn't lose these Shia regions to, you know, like they wouldn't let the other, you know, like any other system basically, like the Middle East later, or to take over. This basically like the, these regions, and they could be potentially, right, big big obstacle basically for unity of unity of Muslims actually in the future. Yeah, I right? mean, uh, it's sorry to yeah. interrupt you there, uh, Brother Ali. Raza, just to add to your point, yeah, I think that um, if we look at um, what Amer- America has used Iran for so far, and it actually uh, builds on what you're saying. is the fact that one thing we can see is that from day one the Iranian revolution has been used as a scarecrow um, for the for the region because the uh, 
the, the, the policy always was that the revolution needs to be carried to the other countries. Okay, that's how it was shown. And we saw the Iran, we saw the Iraq war. We also see, you mentioned earlier about the Shia crescent. I, we see that, you know, after 9-11, what we can see certainly is through the actions of America, is that the, the, the Shia countries or the Shia areas within the Middle East have been strengthened. And even the Americans use the term the Shia Crescent and the Sunni Ark. They use this themselves because, you know, from their point of view, uh, and, and, and I would say that, you know, uh, not a matter of opinion, but the reality is, is if we look at the, the Islamic revival and we look at the, the return of the Islamic Khilafah system, this is most likely, uh, if not definitely, going to happen in a country which is predominantly Sunni. Okay, I don't think there's any arguments in that. Okay, so if so, a strong, a strong base, uh, a Shia base is a, a big obstacle, and especially a strong Shia base, and especially one which has been, uh, which has been told about the sectarian sectarianism, which has been taught the history that the Sunnis always oppress them. So these people have power now to think that the tomorrow the the Islamic State is going to return. And then these countries are just going to say, here, you have the control back. I don't think that's going to happen. And one of the other things we've seen is that the Americans have used, and this is more recent now, that the Americans are actually, subhanAllah, use the Iranians to do something which, at one stage, you would thought unimaginable, which is to openly now normalize relationships between the Gulf Arab countries and Israel, where you've got, where you've got people on Saudi national TV debating whether Israel or whether Iran is the number one enemy of the Saudis and the Sunnis. Okay, this is something that would be impossible if there wasn't an Iran using its rhetoric about destroying this and, and continue the revolution and destroying Tel Aviv. and You know, all talk never has it ever done anything. So, you know, what we can see is that many things so far, we can see how Iran has fitted in perfectly for the American agenda in the region and even moving forward we can see that this is going to continue but I think Rash makes a valid point that um, what we see is that in one way maybe uh, America now wants to uh, backtrack and, and, and revert some of the influence, the Iranian influence within Syria, within Lebanon, within Iraq because now it has facilitated what it needed to do in the area, i.e. maybe the, the Sunni Shia issue, okay? So maybe it's, it's bringing that back now. Um, and at the same time, what we can see is that, in fact, it's still going to use Iran as a scarecrow for the Gulf countries because right now, the Americans, the amount of money they're making of the Gulf countries with weapons, arm sales, yeah. arm sales and with what's happening in Yemen, for example, the arms sales is, 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 and when Trump talks about the economy and how, you know, they're making, they're making the Arabs pay for it now, they're clearly doing this. So we can see, you know, that there's many, many advantages for the Iranians in the past and moving forward uh, for the Americans to use the Iranians. And it looks like the Iranians are happily to, happy to fulfill this role. Yeah, and to be fair, this is what, you know, if you read the Brookings Institute paper that was released all the way back in 2009, it highlights just how important America sees Iran as a strategic kind of player within the Middle East. It, it kind of clarified within there that it would have lots of different kind of plans, plans from like several if something failed something else so they had ideas of how you could dissuade the iranians from taking part in certain projects how they could disarm them how they could even go as far as causing a military coup and toppling the regime if they didn't carry out actions according to what they wanted so they almost realized well not almost they realized from the start that iran plays this role that you just described there very well in the region to make sure these conflicts are happening whether it's like you say to prevent the revival of islam going forward and it's happening now or even the fact that the these arms sales from a financial point of view if there's this ever ongoing conflict in the region which we know 
When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that, you know, the, the haq and batil, the clash between that will continue. But who facilitates that? A lot of this is with the wealth of our ummah and the, and the ideas that America are throwing into the region and keeping these conflicts going. And what's happening? All of the ummah's wealth is being spent on arms, fighting and spilling Muslim blood. Mm. And so we can see they've had these plans in place from many years ago. And we need to be be aware of this more than anything else. Yeah, subhanAllah. Maybe a couple of more points would be beneficial here, you know, like the, uh, probably we could look at to the Yemen's conflict as well from here. So what's happening in Yemen, like the why, you know, there is conflict in Yemen, for example. So we can, again, you know, like the, we talked about like the how much the US, you know, like the selling weapon to Muslim countries. And one of the most important Muslim countries is Saudi Arabia. And they kind of, you know, like the, I would say deliberately cause a uh, conflict, you know, like the, in Yemen to have like the, you know, conflict next door to Saudi as well, to be able to sell even more weapon basically to uh, Saudis over there. Yeah. And make them to feel actually, you know what, Iran is not like the, <coughs> sorry, Iran is, uh, that's right, Iran is too far, uh, a bit far from you, you don't have border, but they've got their allies actually next door. Yeah, exactly. So that's, you know, like the, if you look at the all like the big, big Muslim countries, like the, you know, there is always, you know, like the little group or, you know, like the even big group, like the Shia groups who are actually causing problem over yeah. there. And you know I'm what? not saying the Saudi system is the best system. They are this similar system to like the uh, what you call Iranian system as well. They fulfilling you know like the different objectives basically for USA and West. But in the meantime, you know like the, the US, you know like the, who's actually another conflict actually over there to sell even more weapon, you know like the Saudis. And one might ask, you know. Uh, why Saudi, like uh, why uh, US putting like the, these much sanctions on Iran? And if you know, like the US wants actually Iranian like strong military in Middle East, why are they putting that like, this much sanctions in place? First of all, you know the sanctions is not directly affecting the army or the government or the Revolutionary Guard. If it was directly affecting them. The Revolutionary Guard couldn't fight outside Iran for the last 15 years. It's a good point, okay? So it's directly have got big impact on ordinary people. Mm. While the 60 million of Iranian now, right, from 20 years ago till now, they living under the poverty line, basically. Subhanallah. What they call like the red line, mm. right, in Iran, right? So that's, you know, what's happened for people. But we can see with these sanctions, the Revolutionary Guard oh is even the same Revolutionary Guard and even getting uh, what you call stronger and stronger every day, right? They're making more missiles and so on and on. They're fighting even in more places, but it's got direct impact on people. So don't forget our, like the generally talking about the revolution, people would do revolution, one of the, Factors of revolution, for example, which happens in 1979 in Iran, when people are living wealthy life, right? They are not living in poverty. Hmm. People in Iran, 60 million under the you know red line, basically, what they would think about? They would think about to work two, three shifts, mm -hmm. okay, to provide for their family. So, so they also, wouldn't. So also, what you're saying, the brother Ali Raza, linked back to one of your other points, was that right now. Iran, if there was, a, a, if America really wanted to do a regime change, right now it would probably be very easy for them because sixty percent of the people, or sixty million people, are under the poverty line. There's all these demonstrations that we're not finding about because the Western Western media, which knows about it but which isn't showing it, with all this conflict that happened, you know, you could argue that right now, if they wanted to, they could easily remove this system and put some secular people there. And it just goes to show what the Americans are like because, you know, inevitably their goal is to secularize the entire Muslim world, right? 
Um, exactly. and, and in a way, one could argue that, okay, then, well, if that's what they want to do, then they need to remove the system. But what we can see is that they actually benefit in two ways, um, if I can quickly make this point, with this system. The first one we've already talked about, i.e. The, the, all the benefits that America uses Iran for. But the other point is that if you look at the 1979 revolution at that time, you could argue that people wanted Islam and they were behind this. But in almost 40 years or however long it's been, what we can see is through this corrupt system, through, through this corrupt ayatollahs, in fact, it's alienated those people from Islam. They now actually call themselves secular seculars. So in reality, they are promoting secularism in Iran. And when the moment is right, they will flick the switch and they will remove these ayatollahs from their thrones and they can change the system uh, very quickly. Yeah, exactly. These ayatollahs, they really benefited, you know, like them, like the perfectly, whether, you know, willingly or unwillingly. Even, you know, like, let's look at, the, you know, like, the probably one of the last points, you know, let's look at the 40 years ago, you know, like, the, or 20 years ago. There weren't any conflict, like the Shia-Sunni conflict, basically, right? So these ayatollahs perfectly, you know, like, they did what the U.S. basically kind of ordered them. Right, she has only conflict. No one like the, up to like the twenty years ago, probably if you ask like the Muslims, you know, what is Shias and Sunnis, they wouldn't even know about that. They they haven't, you know. I've got many friends like from Turkey, they you know, like the, they say we didn't know like the who are the Shias, you know, up to fifteen, twenty years ago. Right? Yeah, this yeah. Ayatollahs promoted sectarian, like the you know, uh, what you call like the sectarianism basically you know like the in uh, muslim region as well which is again you know like the, another potential you know problem for unity of muslims you know like the uh, in future and mm -hmm. even you know like the look at what they've done in iran the yeah. same people who wanted islam now they want like a secular government exactly so yeah. last point last point okay with like the uh, uh, Muslims, you know, if they really think about, right, this, you know, like the uh, Iranian system is going to revive actually the Ummah, I think they are definitely, you know, like the, they are definitely wrong. Because if they could revive actually the Ummah, first of all, they would revive actually people from their own country. Yeah, exactly. Right? exactly. And which we can clearly see they were big decline actually like the, in Iran from religious point of view. Yeah. So you would definitely right. say that from 40 years ago, the Islamic sentiment is not is nowhere near what it was 40 years ago. It's declined much more than that. Exactly, that's yeah. the point. And, and we can clearly see in Iranian society, yeah. basically. And that yeah. makes it quite clear why the US are happy with the Ayatollahs there, because it is ca carrying that out. It's making sure that division remains, to the extent that when Trump most recently, after the Soleimani assassination, he did... He did kind of do a bit of a veiled threat to the Europeans that look the Iranians are dangerous they're just around the corner you guys need to make sure you fund NATO in order that you know we're not in need of um, Middle Eastern oil anymore we're self-sufficient you know when he said that I think maybe a lot of people didn't realize but what he's saying under the hood is like we can suffice ourselves with our own oil reserves you guys in Europe need Middle Eastern oil therefore you should continue to fund NATO because look you've got this kind of country on your on your doorstep which co is going to cause more conflict so you can see how it all fits into that US plan yeah subhanallah subhanallah so um one last last sort of point and then we can uh, sort of uh, wrap up and 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 maybe maybe summarize the the mm. podcast is the fact that I just was having a thought about a lot of the things that both of you guys were talking about i.e. Uh, the assassination of Soleimani, the uh, the uh, the fact that you mentioned America wants to clip the wings um, of the Iranians, i.e. in places like Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, where they achieved what they needed to, they fulfilled their objective. And I was actually, uh, I did come across uh, an opinion, an analysis by someone, and, and actually what he was saying is that the Iranian government themselves, they're more than happy of of leaving places like um, uh, Syria and these places because A, they're unpopular at home and secondly, they cost money. But just to quickly add at this point as well that we were speaking about the other day, Ali Raza, that uh, 
even the money that the uh, that was freed up, the Iranian money that was freed up through that nuclear deal, actually went and got pumped into the uh, Iranian activity abroad, which achieved the Americans' objective. But if I can finish my point, is that what he was saying is that uh, the Iranians want to leave these areas, but Soleimani is a fact, and he himself said that he's the one who runs a foreign policy, Iran's foreign policy in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq. And what they was actually saying is that he was refusing to do so. Okay, so it may well be, you know, uh, like I said, this is just an opinion that it's not a coincidence, especially the fact that previously George Bush and previously Obama had the option to kill Soleimani and they never, and the fact that he dies now. But I know. But the Ali Reza is itching to say something, but I'm not going to give you the opportunity at this moment. What I'm going to say is that let's sort of wrap this podcast up, inshallah ta'ala, um, and let's sort of summarize uh, what is it that we want our listeners to take away. Um, I think I'll, I'll say the first point, which is the obvious point, is the fact that this myth behind Iran being the savior of the Muslim world and Iran being the only country that's against Israel or against America, this is something which is not the case. Uh, this is just hot air. It's empty rhetoric. They've not done anything in their 40 years um, or however long they've been there. And the fact that you guys have demonstrated through clear examples of you know uh, involvement between and collusion between the Americans and the Iranians at the highest level um, for decades now. And, and, and enemies don't behave in such a way. Uh, is there anything else you guys want to add as well to this, Brother Reza? To your sort of uh, like yeah, final points? Probably, you know, like the, it's not uh, directly relevant to our discussion, but, you know, the point which, you know, like the, we generally made here, it was about, again, like the Iranian, like the corrupt system rather than the people, okay? So we don't want to cause actually what you call like the separation, like the within like the uh, Muslims basically. So all are, you know, like the people, you know, like the, from different areas of Muslim lands, they are following different facts and, you know, uh, so on. So it's not like the people are not really like the enemy of each other. They are like the, all like the Muslim brothers. That's, you know, that's the fact, Muslim brothers and sisters. So that's the real fact. We just been talking, you know, about the crop system actually, like the which is not only in Iran, in many other different Muslim countries, which they are fulfilling the American objectives. Of course. Region. And that's, you know, uh, the point which I wanted to make uh, in the end. Okay. Okay. Jazakallah for that. And uh, Brother Rush? Yeah, I'd just like to say again, it, it, it links on to the fact that as Muslims, we really need to be aware that a lot of the leaders that are placed in charge of our countries or are given the opportunity to remain in charge of our countries, often they, you know, they are put there because there's certain sentiment on the ground. But then it is those leaders who are being steered by our enemies. And it's very important that we start to realise this. And we can see this with the Iran situation. In addition to that, even some of this, these bombings, these, you know, when people are assassinated, especially like a state assassination here, not just a random person. Yeah. Where are the military bases? You talked about it today. Those military bases are in our lands. Why are those military bases in our lands? We should question this. At the same time, how are they able to bomb uh, Muslims? Again, the airspace is being controlled or we are allowing people who are enemies, people who are causing conflict in our lands to move around in our airspace freely. Exactly. They are able to shoot down a passenger plane just like that. Yet there's these, air, you know, aircrafts, um, US aircrafts, Western aircrafts, drones going around our lands freely bombing people. So I think as for the audience, it's very important to appreciate some of these issues that as Muslims, we should highlight. So from today's podcast, I think we should realize that, look, you know, it is quite strategic to get Iran to be a bit more isolationist in this case, in that it's, they're not involved in some of the neighbouring lands. It's very important to see that the whole Shia Sunni threat or the conflict between the, two, the Muslims to disunite them was strategic because of, of you know, the plans of America and to normalise Israel in the region. Definitely. This was part of this. 
So when the Western nations and US as their leader stoke the tensions between Muslim countries, what are they doing? Firstly, they're making it very difficult for the Muslims on the ground to revive, but they're doing it at the same time as usurping our wealth to buy weapons and therefore filling their own coffers and, you know, helping them economically. So we can see all of this and even the main thing for us is to notice that let's not be duped by the media and these very hollow words. Let's, as Rez, Brother Ali Reza said at the beginning, look at the actions that they carry out. The Iranian response was just there to save face. Did they actually harm the US in any way? No. Whereas in, in theory, the US has harmed them gravely and on top of that is putting sanctions on them as well and making those harder. And again, as the brother said very clearly, that that makes the impact of that is on the people, on the common people on the ground. It's not affecting the leaders and it's not affecting the people that are already are wealthy people in that in those nations. So yeah. these things I would say that our audience really need to take away and be aware of. Subhanallah, bro. I think uh, you know, that was a, a, a very good summary, quite comprehensive. The only thing I'd like to add to that is just advice for uh, ourselves and also for our listeners out there is that many times I see Muslims use the language of the non-Muslims, of the secularists, of the capitalists when they talk about human rights and, and all these things. What we need to understand is that Islam, we have a unique system. We shouldn't be referring to the system uh, of the, of the non-Muslims, especially when clearly daily they actually go against their own systems when you know the hypocrisy is so is so mad where you know they've gone and killed a, a, a high ranking official of another sovereign nation in another country and you know imagine if some muslim country or some muslims had done the same it would be mad and you know and and the fact that another thing you know and this really angered me was when the uh, when the Iraqi government when they uh, in the parliament they issued you know like the non-binding uh, um, uh, law uh, to do with uh, all foreign forces to leave uh, Iraq, and you know Trump came out and said we're not going anywhere, and if we go we're going to make sure that you pay us back since all the money we put in since two thousand and three. So these guys went there. In 2003, illegal this war. illegal war destroyed it on on based on lies, you know, created killed millions of people, millions of refugees, and now they want to be, get paid for it, you know. Subhanallah, this is hypocrisy at the highest level. And as Muslims, you know, we should um, not use their language because they are not even uh, they don't even follow their rules, and we should clearly point this out, especially when Muslims are being accused. Of being barbaric and violent, etc. So, inshallah, ta'ala, I'm gonna bring this podcast to an end. Uh, what I would like to say first of all is, uh, Jazakallah khair uh, to Brother Rash, you know, uh, is not being the same uh, without him. And also for our brother from Iran and uh, Brother Ali Raza and Subhanallah. And uh, bro brother, honestly, your input has been, um, uh, it's been invaluable. Uh, and something which you know uh, we would not have been able to illustrate to our listeners without you know you be able to give that first hand information and that's what we try to do uh, in the voice of the ummah and talking deen you know the fact that we want to speak about the issues that affect the ummah and we want to bring everyone on board um, and get their perspective you know and the fact that you were able to do that and inshallah ta'ala you know there's so much to talk about and uh, I hope in the future you'll inshallah join us again. Inshallah. Jazakallah for having me here. Inshallah, I will be definitely happy, you know, like the, uh, to discuss more about these matters and, you know, uh, in the future, inshallah. Jazakallah, so, bro. Uh, and uh, for all our listeners, please subscribe to our uh, channels um, and uh, follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on um, Instagram. YouTube, uh, we've got loads, Telegram, you know, subhanAllah, we've got loads, inshallah, soon we'll have a website up as well at some stage, so that's something to look forward to, uh, but please share this content to, uh, to, you know, far and wide, and let's get this awareness out, and not be duped by the Western media, and not pin our hopes 
on those people who only fulfill the uh, agenda of the enemies of the Muslims and the enemies of Islam. Uh, on that note, I'd like to say uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.